Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Voices in Clinical and Translational Science series sponsored by the Integrated Translational Health Research Institute of Virginia, or iThrive. For those of you who I've not met, my name is Karen Johnston. I'm the director of iThrive. And as you recall, the mission of iThrive is to catalyze and sustain inclusive clinical and translational research through diverse collaborative team science, innovative data science, and broad workforce development in order to improve human health and promote health equity. This new series serves as a platform to lift outstanding researchers and underrepresented voices in research across the iThrive partnership with a focus on promoting dialogue and encouraging team science. The series is aimed at ampl amplifying diverse perspectives in clinical and translational research to foster innovative and an inclusive environment. We will be highlighting some of our amazing researchers who will share their research and their lived experience with us. So now it is my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Mustafa Mustafa, and you are in for a treat today, I will tell you. Dr. Mustafa is currently Chief Resident in General Surgery at UVA and will be graduating in just a few short days. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and his MD at Yale. He joined us at the University of Virginia as a surgical resident in 2015, and he has completed two additional fellowships during this past seven years that he's been in training with us. He completed a postdoctoral research fellowship with the Division of Trauma at Harvard in 2018, and he completed a global surgery fellowship at the University of Utah in 2019. He has received numerous academic leadership and humanitarian awards, and he's not even finished with his residency training yet. <clears throat> so uh, really a, a remarkable uh, uh, background already. He has a remarkable international clinical experience as well, uh, and has been a leader for nearly two decades in humanitarian activities, which is re really remarkable because he's still so junior just finishing his training. He's the founder of the United to Heal effort for medical supply recycling, which has provided nearly $12 million in donated supplies. He's been involved in, the, in that effort for over 15 years. He also founded the Savannah Water Project, which builds, well, builds wells in Northern Ghana. I believe he's gonna share some of his stories related to these roles uh, as he talks to us today. So Dr. Mustafa will be speaking to us today on poverty, justice, and surgery, the medical neglect of the global South. It is an absolute joy for me to have Dr. Mustafa join us here today. I first heard him speak of couple months ago when he gave a grand rounds here at UVA. And I was so profoundly touched by his work to date and his message that we invited him to join us here at the Voices series before he leaves UVA uh, at the end of June. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mustafa. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um... I am uh, very humbled and very grateful again for the opportunity to share some reflections um, on these themes. These are things that I have been uh, thinking about for a very long time. Um, so I'll just um, get right into it. Um, great, so I have uh, no disclosures. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about who I hope this talk is for. And uh, it's of course for you know, all of my colleagues and co-residents and uh, uh, colleagues again in the workplace, but I really hope that if there's any juniors in the audience, um, students or uh, more junior uh, residents or people coming up through their training, whatever their ultimate path might be, that they would take particular note because I think a lot of these concepts are best thought about early. And I think the younger we are, the more moldable and, and that can be important. I have a twofold objective in this talk. And the first is to highlight that neglect towards the global South is on many fronts of which healthcare is only one. And the second is to challenge our role as workers within healthcare and science 
in terms of addressing these disparities. My, um, my title you know, is Poverty, Justice, and Surgery, but I think you can easily replace the word surgery with medicine, research, nursing, pharmacy, physical therapy, radiology, pathology, and so forth, right? Because the point I think extends far beyond a subspecialty. And it's my hope too that some of what I say makes you feel uncomfortable because it is only discomfort that drives us into action. I wanna also talk about what this talk is not. It will not just be a list of data points highlighting surgical disparities. I think frankly, the uh, intro section of any paper on the topic accomplishes that. And importantly, this talk also is not so much about solutions as it is about understanding. I think many people much smarter than me who have been working on this topic for far longer have been working their whole lives to try to come up with a solution. And yet we still live in many ways in a much more unequal world than ever before. So it's not so much about solutions as it is about just understanding. And Malcolm X said, truth does not change, only our awareness of it. And with that, I'd like to share three truths that I think just about everybody can agree upon. It's really difficult to claim that everyone can agree upon a statement, but you know, let's just see. So the first is that we live in a grotesquely unequal world. Things that we mostly agree are universal rights, healthcare, child safety, access to clean water, life expectancy, are heavily, heavily influenced by things beyond our control. Where we are born, the financials of our parents and our society, the color of our skin. The second truth is that the powerful are more able to affect change than the weak. And the third is that those who have it good don't want change or to put some nuance to it are perhaps less willing to sacrifice for a change. Why should they when things are so good? Our world is in fact very unequal. And every time I revisit the numbers, it strikes me just how much so. And credit to the recently late Paul Farmer who kind of put uh, global surgery specifically uh, uh, on the uh, minds of people within the global health sphere when he called it the neglected stepchild of global health in 2008. But to touch just briefly on the numbers, 5 billion people lack access to safe surgery and anesthesia around the world. Of the 300 million plus procedures done annually, only 6% happen in the poorest countries where a third of the world's population lives. An extra 143 million more surgical procedures are needed in low and middle income countries annually. And this need is, is geography dependent. You know, it's not just everywhere. There are specific parts of the world, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Progress in healthcare has been really unequal. In many low resource parts of the world, morbidity and mortality has actually increased and case fatality rates remain unacceptably high for common, easily treatable conditions, such as the ones you see there. And again, there are many, many papers that delve into kind of the big picture scale of disparities, but I won't bore you with too many numbers and I'll just, Leave this, leave this one slide up here, which highlights the surgeon per capita between the UK and East Africa. East Africa has an average of one surgeon per 200,000 people compared to 110 in the US and in England. And from the perspective of the lone doctor toiling for his or her people, right? We graduate training quickly to join this side of the tree. And in fact, just in my class of five graduating residents, we will produce a surgical workforce greater than that of some countries. I think it's important too to understand that big disparities exist within countries. And surgical capacity within countries is almost wholly isolated to cities. 
And in Haiti, for example, maternal mortality approached 1,400 per 100,000 people, which is a staggering number. And yet C-section rates among the wealthy within cities did not differ too much from the rates among the wealthy in New York. I personally experienced this. This was a picture I took in an operating room in Lebanon where I watched a very skilled laparoscopic surgeon take out a gallbladder in about 15 minutes. And this was just down the road from one of the largest uh, Syrian refugee camps in the region where they certainly did not have that kind of access to healthcare. And I think this highlights the fact that global health disparities occur along divides of global north and global south. So what is the global south? The American University defines it as the nations of Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin and Central America and South Asia. It is home to many of the world's poorest people who face hunger, political and social insecurity, and the threat of becoming refugees. And they are at the mercy of regional and ethnic conflicts. But the global South is not so clear cut as to draw a line. And a more nuanced map here based on GDP demonstrates key changes in an, in an attempt to map out the global South. But I think the most important nuance is captured in this quote here from an excellent article on the topic that states that the global South exists everywhere and is all around us. It can be in parts of Los Angeles, it could also be in India. The global South is constructed to separate the rich from the poor and the well-developed from the underdeveloped. And I think if we reflect on our own experience, you don't need any graphs to know that there is a correlation between poverty and some diseases, right? Just ask any uh, transplant surgeon, for example, or an ER nurse, if they think that there's a correlation between poverty and what they see at the workplace. So do we contribute to these disparities and these injustices? Perhaps not actively, but I think the uncomfortable truth is that by virtue of working and researching in our society, we are subject to financial pressures that are not centered around social justice. And a classic example of this for me comes from examining the funding disparities for the so-called neglected tropical diseases. And I think what matters here is not what diseases are they, but why are they so underfunded? Is it because they are not that morbid? These diseases are in fact some of the leading causes of disability adjusted life years and mortality, right? Is it because they don't kill enough people or is it because they are not revenue generating uh, 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 um, medications, right? Is it because the, the people that these diseases affect are not wealthy and able to pay for expensive medications? Worldwide, we spend over $100 billion annually on drug R&D. About 3 billion of that, so 3% is spent on the three big players, HIV, TB, and malaria. And a fraction of that is spent on the over 15 neglected tropical diseases. These images, when they first kind of hit the international scene, surprised the world. Um, these are pictures of African river blindness, uh, which is transmitted by uh, fly bite. And it was very common to see uh, children walking around their blind parents with a stick. And it's all the more enraging when you consider that the treatment for it is just once a year ivermectin. And if you look at a map on the left here, my screen of the neglected tropical diseases, and you compare it with a map of the global south, you can see clearly the parallels. And this highlights the fact that neglect towards the global south goes well beyond even just funding. As a matter of fact, the term the third world has emerged as an offensive term being replaced by low and middle income countries. But it is perhaps a more honest term in terms of highlighting how the global north prioritizes these countries and their people. 
even in our map. This is the map that we're used to. It's the one on Google, it's the one in our textbooks and our research graphs. We exaggerate the north and we diminish the south. And if we look at this, you know, North America looks huge, Greenland looks huge, but that's not actually true. Alaska is not actually that big. Antarctica certainly isn't that big. This on the right is what a size accurate map of the world actually looks like. And the thing that becomes immediately apparent is just how huge the global south and particularly Africa is. As a matter of fact, you can fit the US, China, India, most of Europe, Japan, all within the, uh, uh, the bounds of Africa. My disappointment and anger with the corporate representation of the global south began early. These are images from the 2004 tsunami that devastated Southeast Asia. And nearly 200,000 people died, one of the most staggering losses of life in a single day. And I remember my, my outrage at news outlets that night, many of whom focused on pop culture issues and continue to do so, despite the fact that this was ongoing. In 2010 came the Syrian uprising and the response by the government and the proxy governments in Syria was unusually devastating, even by comparison to other authoritarian regimes. These sheets are not being hung to air dry. These are actually being hung to act as visual blocks against snipers taking out innocent civilians if they were just existed in rebel held areas. The limits of human cruelty reached new heights for me witnessing what was going on in Syria. Ambulances were explicitly targeted, barrel bombs, which are basically big oil drums filled with shrapnel were being indiscriminately dropped on heavily uh, populated civilian zones. Still the most gruesome and troublesome thing I heard from the surgeons working there is they would describe pattern injuries. They would describe patterns to the sniper injuries. One day the patients they saw would all be shot in the neck. Another day it would be knee shots. Still other days it was pregnant women shot in their abdomens. They were not allowed in fact to treat their people and sometimes snipers would set around areas where bombs had been dropped and they would take out healthcare workers going in to treat the injured. These are pictures from um, an operating room, uh, doctors, and surgeons, nurses, they had to set up underground hospitals in an attempt to save their people. This is a picture of surgeons operating just by headlight in the dark. Illegal weapons were used. There was widespread documentation of white phosphorus, a picture of which is here being dropped on a pretty uh, densely populated civilian zone. In 2015, a Syrian defector by the alias Caesar came out with the Caesar report. It was one of the most uh, comprehensive documentations of widespread torture ever. And it was corroborated by satellite imagery and other news outlets and what uh, everybody involved with the Syrian issues expected to make a massive outroar, you know, barely caused a thud. And this highlighted to me this truth that the powerful are more able to affect change than the weak. With the current situation in Ukraine, it's heart-wrenching to see the ongoing loss of life. And I don't think any people on earth understand what the Ukrainians are going through more than the Syrians. Still, it's impossible to ignore the fact that neglect continues to be ongoing. Uh, Alan McLeod had a series of tweets kind of highlighting this. Uh, Charlie Degada, who's a CBS foreign correspondent, said this isn't Iraq or Afghanistan. This is a relatively civilized, relatively European city. UK personality, Matthew Wright, 
he was talking about a bomb that was dropped in Afghanistan. He said, to be fair, the U.S. had used uh, this before in Afghanistan, but the idea of it being used in Europe is stomach churning. McLeod again highlighted the fact that The Economist seems to have finally found a war that it does not like. But I think the most important nuance here is captured by this quote from Katerina Ritz, who is head of the uh, ICRC delegation in Yemen. She said, it's not about Ukraine or not, just about adding it to the list. Since 2014, Yemen has become one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. And in the first three weeks, Ukraine actually received more coverage than what has been going on for seven years in Yemen, which has been on the brink of famine for years. The Rohingya in Myanmar have been subject to what international news outlets have called a genocide, creating one of the world's um, most devastating refugee crises that has largely affected another poor country that of Bangladesh. The Uyghurs in China currently also going through essentially a genocide, being held in concentration camps, families holding up their pictures of their missing loved ones. The detention camps off the coast of uh, Australia and New Zealand, where immigrants are held and not allowed to leave, full of children, held sometimes, as you see here, for three years. Still, it's amazing to see, you know, pictures like this where uh, people are talking about the wrongs of a superpower invading another country. And it's amazing to me, you know, to see uh, tweets like this even where women are praised on social media for taking up arms against the invader. But it doesn't take a lot of creativity to imagine what the world reaction would be if instead they looked like this. So why should we care? Why should we care about any of this? I think first of all, we should care because it is ethical. This was a quote actually not having anything to do with global health disparities, but came out of the, the COVID pandemic. And this was an opinion by the AMA. Uh, in talking about resources, they said, in general, only very substantial differences among patients are ethically relevant the greater the disparities, the more justified the use of certain criteria becomes. So I think we should care because it is ethical. I think we should also care because inaction is akin to complicity. This is Desmond Tutu, who was Nelson Mandela's right-hand man throughout the uh, black struggle of uh, in apartheid South Africa. And he famously said that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. I think we should also care because medicine has a storied history of being at the forefront of social justice. And Rudolf Virchow who was one of the fathers of modern medicine, famously said that physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor and the social problem should largely be solved by them. And in fact, Virchow believed that he uh, uh, that 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 um, politics was nothing but medicine on a large scale. Many of you perhaps remember the recent uh, tweet by the NRA that said someone should tell self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. So I think you know, as workers in the healthcare field, are we going to stay in our lane and kind of heed the NRA? Or are we going to heed Virchow and medicine's history? I think we have a decision to make. So how can we make a small dent, a very small dent in uh, global health justice? And I think it's easier sometimes to think about this in terms of how not to make a dent. And I think one easy way to not make a dent is to view the title as the end goal whether it's your position on a committee, an organization or medical title, something even I, I say to medical students that you know, you're right on graduation day to feel very accomplished for having gone through medical school. But I think you would be wrong to view your obtaining that MD as the accomplishment because at the end of the day, having a degree does nothing. 
It's what you do with your skill. And my favorite example of this is Muhammad Ali, who you know, said service to others is the rent you pay for your room on earth. And his victories right outside the ring were so much more than those within in terms of what he has done for the uplifting of people. I think with Muhammad Ali, it's also important to remember that he wasn't always loved, but he was actually hated for speaking his beliefs. He refused to fight in Vietnam and said, why should one colored man go kill another color, go kill another colored man, right? No Viet Cong ever called me a racist phrase and I'm paraphrasing there, but he was actually banned from boxing at the height of his boxing abilities. So is there a natural tension between academia and altruism? I don't know, it's something I've thought about a lot, but I think this is something we just have to um, keep at the forefront of our minds because in academia, we tend to be so focused on promotion, which is based on publications, CVs, talks, right? But does that leave room? Does that infringe on room? or selfless acts? Would we realistically engage in all our actions if they only cost and didn't pay back? I think another important thing to consider is to ignore, to not ignore, right? How much impact our research actually has. So we obviously need research to advance the body of literature and knowledge. But especially in academia, I believe that we often focus too much on the quantity of publications, right? At the junior level, we even talk about it sometimes as, a, as if it's a form of currency. When a student has an experience, they say, oh, how many publications did you get? Right? Nobody really ever asks, how many people did you help? This was um, a tweet that came under major fire from players in the international aid spheres which was a study out of Duke that said, basically, if you change how um, everybody cooks in Sub-Saharan Africa, it will make a small dent in the carbon emissions globally. I think the other important thing is we have to really think a lot about access. And uh, one common criticism of a lot of kind of direct uh, direct help is that ultimately you'll only help a few, but with research, right, you can help millions. And this, every time I hear this, I'm reminded of a quote from my pharmacokinetics class, which says that medicines are 100% ineffective in patients who don't take them, right? Similarly, advances in surgery or whatever field it is offer zero benefit for patients who can't access surgery. And the proof is in the pudding. It's been hundreds of years since we've published about germ theory and have discovered antibiotics, but people are still dying today in 2022 from undrained abscesses and no access to antibiotics. This reminds me that it is access that is the real frontier or as much at least of a frontier. We need to focus not just on how high we can push the, the tip of the mountain and how high we can push the envelope, but making sure that the base is as broad as possible. I personally experienced this um, again in Lebanon. This was the, uh, the paper that I was very proud of, uh, speaking about the burden of surgical disease in the Syrian refugee population. But I'm still haunted by, by and large, the most common question that we got going around tent to tent when, uh, you know, after completing the survey. The families would ask, okay, you know, now what's, you know, what's in it for us? Or when is the help coming? And I had nothing to say. I think it's also important to not consider some efforts too small. This was a patient um, that came uh, to us in Sudan, where I was in 2019 with a cleft mission out of Chicago. And this group has been going to the same place uh, about 10 years. And they do about 150 cases over just five days. And uh, on the last day, we had already packed up our supplies and this patient showed up. She had heard about it uh, during the first day when there was a, uh, uh, a little news uh, piece about it. 
and she had made a five day journey from Darfur and showed up on the last day. And so we unpacked some supplies and did her surgery. And I stayed long enough uh, to see her at her post-op visit. And, and this is what she looked like. And I asked her, I said, you know, how, how do you feel? And in very few words, she just said, oh, so much better. You know, and this reminds me of the starfish analogy where a boy is throwing starfish frantically. Thousands of starfish are beached and he's throwing them back into the sea. And a man says to him, what are you doing? You'll never be able to save all of them. And he says, that's okay because for that one, it matters. And for that patient on that day, right? She was the starfish. Somebody once said, you know, don't take advice from people who've never been where you want to go. And I think that's important. Uh, certainly at the junior level, there was a big struggle with finding mentors, but if you just look, there's mentors all around. And if somebody's doing what you want to do, you'll find people, uh, you'll find those people to connect with. Um, Catherine Hamlin in the top left uh, built the uh, Hamlin Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia, treating women with obstetric fistulas for many, many decades. She actually only recently uh, passed away. Um, Sir Meghdi Yaqub is uh, an Egyptian-born uh, surgeon, very famous surgeon in the UK. He's actually the personal doctor of the Queen of England and a hero back in Egypt. He has a huge uh, cardiac center in the south of Egypt, in the south also because it's a gateway to Sub-Saharan Africa and provides free care uh, for heart disease for uh, thousands and thousands of people. Dr. Osgody is a pediatric surgeon, um, was one of my mentors at Yale, very prolific and directs one of the centers for global surgery now at uh, UCSF. Dr. Gail Hood um, is another surgeon and operates these caravans that actually have ORs within them. And, and their motto is the farthest people first. But it's also not just, you know, expats and, 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 and famous people. This was Dr. Narti, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Ghana. And he's one of the most brilliant surgeons that I've ever interfaced with. And he's Ghanaian born and had a scholarship to go study in Cuba. And he could have gone anywhere after that. And I asked him, why are you back here? And he looked at me and said, my whole life, I just wanted to be a bush surgeon. And I put his picture here because, you know, Dr. Narti is essentially nameless, right, within academia. But to me, and I think um, to the thousands of patients and their families whose lives he's touched, he's not nameless. And he kind of highlights that important distinction for me. Who, to, to whom do I want to be known? That's something that I think we all have to think about from time to time. So how can we make a dent, a very small dent? I think we have to reflect on our subjugation to pressures of all forms. We have to recognize that global does not necessarily mean international. We have to realize that there's nothing wrong with low hanging fruit. We have to think outside the box and most importantly, we have to work on continuing to care. Uh, one of the critiques with uh, surgery in particular is that it takes a lot of time. And how do we just have the time? But I think depending on just how much time you have, there are many ways to get involved. And again, I think this is an analogy for whatever field you're in, right? You don't have to go and spend six months or a year. You don't even have to travel, right? Sometimes you just have to look at it. Look, look, look around you for ways to get involved. And again, I think COVID really highlighted the fact that global surgery does not necessarily mean international. And, um, you know, again, if, if you just reflect on your own experiences, I think you'll realize that a lot of us do more global work than we may realize. Still, um, it's challenging to provide surgical care 
in low, uh, really low resource areas. There's a number of factors. Um, I wrote about, uh, I wrote and read, right, uh, hundreds of times about uh, low resource environments, but it wasn't until I opened this anesthesia fridge in Sudan that it really hit me what low resource means. This is one of my favorite pictures for a number of reasons. This is a scrub sink in Ghana. And um, I love it because it also shows how somebody tried to help. This is the, uh, the Avogard frame. And you normally attach uh, you know, the bottle to it here. But this shows that you know, what's fancy in the short term is worse than what's effective and available in the long term. Health literacy is a big problem. This was uh, my driver in Ghana and uh, I initially kind of ignored this large bowl she had under her shirt. Finally, I said to him, what, what is that there? And he said, I think I have a hernia. And when I asked him some questions about it, he described uh, you know, a lipoma with worrisome features concerning potentially for a sarcomatous degeneration. It started growing suddenly very fast. And, and um, I told him he really had to get that addressed. And I made a phone call for him down the street to the surgeon I was researching with and was very happy to see this when I came back that he had gotten taken care of. But the kicker here is this gentleman had insurance and he had a, access to a surgeon just down the street. But it was health literacy here that was the problem. And one of the things I, I came to realize is that a lot of uh, surgeons in Ghana and other least re low resource areas are very frustrated by low, uh, by very late presentations. I've, I've come to call it even the great, the grapefruit threshold, right? People don't seek um, attention for things until it's the size of a grapefruit when it's very late. An example of this was um, this patient um, initially presented with a very small, uh, and I'm talking about the patient, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, but the patient on uh, the left of the screen is initially presented with a very small tumor in the right upper quadrant of her breast and was told that she needed to get this addressed, but she couldn't afford the biopsy. And so she went away and now came back when it was a much larger tumor and a, and a much more advanced cancer. And in fact, many women in Ghana present with cancers that look like this really late stage and well beyond uh, the realm for um, an attempt at cure with treatment and they just go palliative. And it's sad because if they present early enough, uh, most of these, if not, certainly most would be highly treatable conditions. But there's also a huge connection, right, between health literacy and poverty. And you don't have to go to Ghana to see this. This was a patient that showed up in our clinic here at UVA with this fungating breast cancer. And, um, you know, ultimately when I asked her, why did it take her so long to get in? It's for the same reasons, fear, denial, fear of catastrophic health expenditures, which are a major issue. There's talk constantly, uh, nowadays even more and so, about um, the rising cost of healthcare. I think, you know, when we kind of take the big picture view, why things are spiraling out of control, um, why is that? It's certainly not because of physician or nursing salaries. I pulled these screenshots uh, from Google just the other day, just looking at uh, some of the health insurance companies and what their stocks have done recently. And if, I mean, if you look at this, it's, it's exponential, right? Just since 20, 20, 2016. Right? Here's United. Here's, I mean, here's what United stock has done 350,000% all time since the 80s. And this reminds me again of Vercal, right? This is what happens when we delegate all of this to just the administrators and the insurance companies and the businessmen. Um, Ghana is a, is a beautiful place. This is a picture uh, we took off uh, Lake Volta. When I was in Ghana, I visited uh, Cape Coast Castle. 
which is an emotionally difficult place because it's where uh, the slaves were held in these dungeons before making the trip to the new world. And those that survived would go through these long tunnels. And finally, they would go through this door that came to be known as the door of no return. Um, 400 years ago, the ocean actually came right up to the castle. There was, so there was no beach here. And they would go straight through these doors onto the ships and onto the new world. And I put this here because we cannot talk about disparities without discussing the ravages of colonialism. Kwame Nkrumah said that those who would judge us merely by the heights we have achieved would do well to remember the depths from which we started. Thomas Sankara, I wanna talk a little bit about Thomas Sankara who was president for a few short years in uh, Burkina Faso uh, in the late 80s. He was an incredible leader. He was only in his 30s. He changed the name of the country from the colonial name Upper Volta, which was a meaningless name to the nationals, to something meaningful. He was a fierce pan-Africanist and he believed in both the material and ideological freedom from colonialism. He sold the government fleet of Mercedes and bought the cheapest cars available. He stopped first class travel for his cabinet. He increased his country's literacy from the low single digits to over 60% in a very short span. Above all this, he was humble. He refused to have statues of him made. He was the first to appoint women to his cabinet. But the most dangerous thing that he did was that he made Burkina Faso nutritionally independent. He quadrupled wheat production and stopped importing wheat from Europe and famously said, he who feeds you controls you. The historians you know, say that this was really the, can the straw, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And the French colluded with his compatriots after he did that and he was assassinated shortly thereafter. And this is a theme throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Anybody interested? And I, I, I challenge you to do this. Go read about the history of the Congo and read about Patrice Lumumba and how he met his demise. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, similarly so. And, um, you know, this is a picture of, of Brussels in Belgium. And uh, I remember when I first kind of visited Europe, I was awestruck by the magnificence of some of the architecture. But I was more awestruck when I found out at who paid for a lot of these buildings. In fact, Belgium, um, uh, Brussels, most of those buildings were all built during the reign of King Leopold II who was known as the Builder King. And they were built with funds from the rubber taken from the Congo. I was amazed that I did not learn or hear about King Leopold until after high school, right? But under Belgian colonial rule, historians estimate that up to 10 million people lost their lives, over half the population. This is a haunting and a famous historical photograph where a father stares at the cut hands and feet of his young daughter, his punishment for failing to meet a rubber quota. And this is just an example here of Belgian colonialism, but far more so can be said of France, right? Think of all of Francophone Africa. Haiti is still reeling from its colonial French history. Just yesterday, actually, the Daily, the, the, the podcast, the Daily ran a piece on uh, uh, France and Haiti. That was really interesting. Um, again, England and what they did throughout the Middle East. And we think of the US as being post-colonial, right? But any colored person knows to the, the synonyms for modern colonialism, neo-colonialism, colonialism, the military industrial complex, 
or just plain bad foreign policy. So how is it then that a continent so wealthy is in need of aid? And Dambisa Moyo critiques this concept. It's actually not that hard to disagree about when you consider how naturally wealthy these countries are, but only if they actually controlled their wealth. Malcolm X said, how can you thank a man for giving you what's already yours? How can you thank him for giving you only part of what's already yours? And he said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and you pull it out six, that's not progress. So how can we make a small dent? I think the first step is you have to believe in your ability to affect some kind of change. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, David Livingstone, who is uh, living deep within Sub-Saharan Africa. And society wrote to him, they said, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to send other men to join you. And he wrote back and said, if you have found men who will only come if there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come even if there is no road at all. And I think we have to think a little bit outside the box. When I was um, in college, we were inspired by this group that recycled medical supplies. And we met as college students and all it took was a few phone calls and we had truckloads of medical supplies being donated that would otherwise get thrown away. And we would send these inventory lists to other hospitals and they would indicate what they want. And we would send these, these, these 40 foot containers and we've made several shipments um, since. But what strikes me here is that this is all available, right? And this was available to college students. And this highlights that, you know, there's so much low hanging fruit everywhere. I tell our juniors in our program that if you know how to do these few things, right? If you can drain an abscess, take out an appendix, do a hernia repair, C-section, bonus points if you can do an X-lap, right? You can spend many lifetimes over saving lives every single day. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, surgery or medicine. I know so many people in the fields of um, uh, well beyond healthcare, right? Whether it's through poetry, music, art, business, engineering, who've had a far greater impact on people than most doctors. You just have to kind of think outside the box. Um, when I was in, uh, in North Ghana, I was walking back one day and the student uh, wanted to show me their school and I went with them to see it. And on the way to that school, we walked by this pond and I was, uh, my, my jaw literally dropped when I learned that this was also where they got their water. This is what their drinking water looks like. And this was just a couple of years ago. And this inspired me to learn more about the water situation there but when when i found this out you know i asked them well what what does it cost to just put a well here i promise you that it was far less than the cost of a needs assessment right a few phone i don't want to make it sound like it was easy but a few phone calls and uh talking to uh, a few elders in the community later and we had a well dug um in that same area and again i've come to learn that throughout the savannah region in Ghana, there's an unbelievable water crisis, right? This is, this is, these are some representative images of what watering holes essentially look like for these people. You can see them filling these uh, at the bottom of the screen here, um, a big pot of water to be used, not for washing. This is what people drink. And, you know, our research group in, in Ghana had been focused on laparoscopy and I, you know, put this here to highlight that when you've got a situation like this, you know, you really have to start from the bottom up, right? You have to really look at the big picture, big picture view. Again, here are what some of these, these pictures look like. Um, and I want to go a little bit fast um, through this, um, but I do want to uh, talk about this, which is this, this actually ended up being our most expensive project. This was uh, a well that a society, an organization had put 
And you can see the thought process here. Somebody thought it would be, you know, a great idea to make it uh, solar. But again, uh, what is available is always what is best. And uh, as soon as the one of the solar panels stop working, the parts are hard to replace. And again, it was actually uh, our most expensive uh, undertaking to convert this particular well from solar to standard electric. And this, again, highlights the fact that ultimately we have to kind of step beyond those bounds because those who have it good are less willing ultimately to sacrifice for a change. And if I may take in our last few minutes a slightly um, philosophical tone to this, um, Hannah Arendt was a famous um, anthropologist and philosopher at the turn of the century, and she witnessed the uh, trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was a, a Nazi bureaucrat that was captured actually from Argentina and brought back to Jerusalem for trial. And uh, she coined the term, the banality of evil. And she was struck watching Eichmann in court because she was expecting to see a monster. And instead he was a really ordinary and boring guy. And she was came she 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 came to 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 say that um, that she came to realize that evil can be accomplished by somebody really boring. And I think an even more profound point is made by her student here in this uh, in this book. Elizabeth Minnick, who talks about the evil of banality. And the point that she makes is that there are not enough moral monsters in the world to do extensive evil. And there are not enough saints, moral saints, to do extensive good. And that in periods of extensive evil, the majority of the work is actually done by ordinary people just working working for a race. So, you know, coming from a, a dictatorship, I know that dictatorship 101 is that if you keep the people preoccupied with how to keep food on the table, they will are less likely to get involved in troublesome politics. But in a relatively wealthy society, how do you distract the masses? And these are not comfortable topics, right? In many ways, these are the easiest topics to put out of sight because they conjure inherently negative feelings. We don't wanna think, we don't wanna feel bad. So we just ignore these topics and we put them out of sight and out of mind. And I think this emphasizes the, the most important thing that I've kind of come to realize over the years is that if we wanna make a difference, we have to not stop caring. Right? There isn't one single action that we can go and do that's gonna change the world. But if we wanna make a difference, we have, to keep, and it, and we, we have to keep caring and that takes work. And in study after study, it's shown that poor Americans are actually the most charitable demographic. And this is because they are the ones that interface with poverty the most. That's why when the wealthy, when they donate, it's philanthropic. It's to put their names on buildings and to, make uh, university endowments bigger. But when the poor donate, they donate to fill fridges and to pay bills. So I tell people sometimes, if you wanna change the world, donate just a dollar a week to whatever you want, but do it for the next 10 years, right? Because it's not a single, it's not the big single acts that make a difference. It's the small consistent ones. This is a uh, famous picture called the Vulture and the Little Girl won a Pulitzer Prize. And I put this here to talk a little bit on the limits, however, of caring. And the story behind this picture is that the photographer who took it, Kevin Carter, actually took his own life a few weeks after taking this picture. So overcome by uh, 
the 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 outcry that came after he took this picture and just the 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 horrors that he witnessed watching the famine in Sudan. And um, this runs tr true to me because you know in 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 reading about war and famine, none of this is pleasant and it can really weigh on you. And if you look at a lot of the actors in the global health um, sphere, many of them tend to be really cynical and even nihilist. And um, the best advice, however, that I ever got on this came from Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Hariri, who is the lead trauma surgeon in Aleppo. He was that guy in the underground caves. He would even, he even said, that working in Syria, that if you hear the bomb, you're okay, right? And this was, this was their motto. And at least several different times working in these underground hospitals, they were literally targeted. But I asked him one day, I was like, how, how do you do this? This is depressing stuff. And he quoted to me um, a saying from the Islamic tradition in which the prophet said that if you have a seed in your hand, and you see the apocalypse on the horizon, you literally see the end of times on the horizon, you should still plant that seed. And he said, you know, I live by this. Thank you very much um, for your attention and for this opportunity. And if we have a couple of minutes, I'd love to hear any questions. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Mustafa. What a stirring talk again, making us all think about things that in our everyday work we sometimes lose sight of. Are there questions from the from the audience? Anyone want to put questions in the chat or turn on your camera? Lots of positive comments in the chat. Well, Mustafa, we wish you nothing but greatness as you continue your work and continue your career to the next chapter. We, as I, as you and I have talked about, I very, very much hope that we can stay in touch with you. You have so much to teach us so much to help us with in terms of thinking about how to remain inspired uh, and to remain active and vigilant. So thank you.